Hello, and welcome to this webcast on Geographic Calculator. I'm Sam Knight, the Director of Product Management here at Blue Marble Geographics. And today we're going to be spending some time talking about Geographic Calculator 2016, and specifically the point database jobs within it. We'll be taking a look at various point database jobs for different purposes, and some geocalc dialogues for working with coordinate systems in the context of those specific types of jobs. As always, our upcoming topics are available on our website, and if you're interested in more comprehensive training uh, about any of our applications, uh, please feel free to consult the, the web addresses on the screen right now. To get started working with point databases in Geographic Calculator 2016, the start page and job guide can give you some basic descriptions of the new types of point database jobs that we have. For those of you familiar with previous versions of Geographic Calculator, you might be familiar with the fact that there was only one point database job, and it did several different things. In the 2016 release, we've actually broken that out to make it a little bit simpler uh, for each of those types of conversions or calculations that we might need to perform. So there are now five distinct types of point database jobs. There are conversions, which are our typical reprojections or coordinate transformations going from one coordinate system to another. There are forward and inverse calculations, where we're doing uh, calculations that are not really conversions. They're calculations uh, relating to distance and azimuth between two points, uh, or a whole series of points in the context of a point database job, going from point to point along a series of waypoints. There are scale and translate jobs that are uh, older sort of brute force transformations where we can apply coefficients, uh, scaling values, rotation values, and skew values uh, to a, a grid uh, coordinate system. Uh, very uh, old school uh, manual transformation type. And best fit and derive datum shift, which are fairly similar um, for different purposes. The point database best fit job allows us to map up a locally established ground coordinate system, uh, sometimes known as a survey grid, uh, an engineering system, uh, plan coordinates. They have a number of different names. Uh, these local coordinates allow us to uh, work on ground measurements, and the best fit job allows us to create a relationship between those ground control points of a local grid and a geodetic control that can be found with something like a GPS or modern surveying techniques. The derived datum shift job does the same idea, except we're mapping up two different geodetic coordinate systems to each other. And this will actually derive a three or seven parameter coordinate transformation between these two networks of control points. So for today's session, we're primarily going to focus on the point database conversions and the forward inverse job. We'll come back in another session and focus more on the, the more nuanced jobs of scale and translate, best fit, and datum shift derivation. So to get started, let's actually go over to a point database conversion job. And let's start by loading some data in. Now, at the top of the screen where we load our data, uh, users who are familiar with older versions are going to see some changes right away. When we go to click the ellipses uh, to open up a data file, it's going to take us right to a file open dialog rather than stopping on that intermediate uh, dialog that we used to have in the interface. I'm going to go ahead and grab onto my uh, Excel sheet here that we're going to take a look at, and we'll take a look at the, how the file load has actually changed. We still see our familiar prompt of loading a header for that file if it's an Excel sheet. Uh, and in this case, I'm going to say yes, my data does have a header, because the first row of that Excel file uh, has column names for us. And we'll see those column names right across the top. So back on the main screen here, if we take a little bit more of a close look at the uh, file load options, we're going to see that we now have a drop down right on the main screen for choosing whether we're loading a file or an ODBC database. That's something that's changed from past versions. That used to be on an intermediate uh, dialog that would come up when we went to add our data. And as well, we have our option for partially loading the data, also exposed right on the main screen. We found that most of our users were working with file-based data, and the partial loading setting really wasn't something that merited its own pop-up dialog for. So we were able to streamline that process, able to get your data in just a little bit more efficiently uh, in this, uh, this current version. 
Now the data grid itself, once the data is loaded in there, uh, folks from previous versions are going to notice some changes there as well. So we've gone to a shaded uh, check register style uh, of highlighting every other row in the grid. And that comes from uh, more than just a little subtle change. Under the hood, we've actually replaced the control that we use to display this data in the application. That new control is both a little bit more visually pleasing. You'll see things like uh, fade in and out as we scroll uh, through our data as it's dynamically accessing the data and putting that back on screen for us. Uh, the check register style shading, but as well, something that's a little more subtle to, you won't actually see this, is that we've gotten a lot more efficient with actually handling the memory when we've loaded in uh, large data sets. So the data grid is now capable of displaying more points at once than it used to be. Uh, as well, that also reduces the need for the partial loading setting. Uh, so users that are uh, familiar with the limits of your machine on how many points you can load in for a preview uh, within the context of the, the data grid here on screen, you might want to try pushing that upper limit again because I think you'll find that we can now comfortably display many millions of uh, rows of data here uh, within the, the data grid. There are still some limitations that are file format specific, such as Microsoft Excel sheets can only handle up to 60,000 uh, and a little bit more rows, about 67,000 rows of data. Uh, and in the, uh, the modern Excel format, the XLSX format, those go up to about a million. But there are a lot of you out there that are still working with very large ASCII databases that can be many, many millions of uh, rows long. Uh, in a given file. So you might want to try loading in some larger data just to see how that performs on your machine. And I think you'll be very pleasantly surprised to find that those upper limits have uh, virtually disappeared. Uh, you can now load extremely large data for visualization and preview and you can scroll through that data uh, in the, the data grid here. Now as well, we've also made some changes to uh, the overall uh, interface. Uh, we do things a little bit differently now. Uh, there are some things that have been uh, visually uh, streamlined and compacted that you may not even notice. And there's also some, some larger changes to expose more settings on the interface here. Now one of the things I'll, I'll point out that is one of the more in invisible changes is the controls at the bottom of the interface. These have all gotten very slightly more compact. They haven't actually shrunk anything, but we were able to more efficiently use space on the screen, and that's actually reduced the overall size of the, the lower portion of the interface. A side effect of that is it allows us to display more of your coordinate data actually on screen. So it's a very subtle change, but even if you're working uh, on a small screen, like a laptop screen, you'll be able to see more of that coordinate data actually displayed at once in the grid. As well, users from uh, previous versions, uh, and this, this goes way, way back, this is a pretty big change for us, there is a button missing from the interface. You'll notice right below that data grid for a long, long time, there's been a button called column settings. And that button would bring up a dialog where we went to select uh, which columns contained our input coordinates and which columns we're going to write our output coordinates to. Now that dialog has completely gone away. This is one of the side effects of splitting the point database job into several different job interfaces. All of those column settings are now going to be exposed right on the main interface. So below each uh, coordinate system, so the input system and the output system, you're also now going to see the input coordinate fields and the output coordinate fields. And we're going to see these change up a little bit as we work through the, the different types of jobs because they require different columns, different numbers of columns, and columns of different information uh, depending on what type of job we're actually setting up. So this sheet that we're working with here today uh, contains uh, some simple uh, UTM projected coordinates. Uh, this data file actually contains uh, information on public boat launches uh, spaced around uh, the state of Maine here where I am. And the first two columns of that contains uh, a northing and easting uh, position uh, relative to UTM zone 19 uh, in uh, uh, NAT 83 coordinates. Uh, in meters. And so what we'll do is a simple uh, conversion on that. We'll convert that over to latitude longitude. Uh, we'll add some new columns in here and uh, run that out uh, to a new coordinate system. So to begin, 
we need to select our coordinate systems for input and output. So our input systems here, uh, we have an X and Y column. Those are representing our easting and our northing. And those I mentioned are relative to UTM zone 19. So I'm going to come down to my input coordinate system field. I'm going to double click on that blue system box. And it's offering me a prompt uh, whether or not I would like to narrow this down based on a geographic area. Now I know exactly where this coordinate system lives on the planet. Um, I know I can get to it in our menu system very quickly, so I'm going to choose no. Uh, the alternative there, if you click yes, that will bring up a map interface and actually allow you to click on a map to narrow that down, uh, to filter that down spatially if you're uh, less familiar with where exactly to find a particular coordinate system for your data. So I'm going to click no, and this is going to bring up our full library of coordinate systems. Now the system I'm looking for, UTM, is a projected system, so I'm going to find that down under the projected category, and I'm going to go down under the UTM folder specifically. And in that UTM folder, there are subfolders for all the datums around the world, and this particular data set I mentioned was relative to NAD83. So I'm going to find our NAD83 folder, and then I'm going to come over here and find the UTM zone uh, for zone 19 uh, based on NAD83. I'm going to click OK, and that returns us back to the main screen with our coordinate system selected. Now the coordinates I'm looking for for output are actually NAD83 latitude longitude coordinates. So uh, I'm going to go and pick the geodetic version uh, of NAD83 uh, for my output side. So I'll do the same on the output side. I'm going to double click on that blue system box. Same prompt here about whether or not we want to use a map. And if you don't wish to use a map and you don't ever or, or you want to always use the map, you can toggle that on or off uh, to suit your particular use case. Um, so I'm going to toggle that off for myself. I generally know where I'm looking for things in our library. So I'm going to go ahead and say no and then find the geodetic version of NAD83. And in this case, it's a continent wide system. So I'm going to find that right under the North America level. When I click OK, that's going to bring me back to my main, main screen here. I've now got my input and output coordinate systems selected. If these were on differing geodetic models, uh, differing datums, I would need to select a coordinate transformation in the center. Uh, if I needed to do that, I would simply double click on it. In this case, when I double click, it's simply going to tell me that no transformation is needed between these two since they do both have the same base model. So let's do that. We'll double click. No transformation needed. We're ready to continue. Now to set up the uh, columns for input and output, my input is all ready to go. I have my X uh, representing my easting and my Y representing my northing. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the easting and northing on those. Uh, y in my northing column, X in my easting column. And then for my output, I need to actually add some columns. So you'll see the grid only expands to fit what data we already have uh, predefined. If I had placeholders already inserted in my data sheet, that would be OK. I could just select those for output. But in this case, I don't actually have those. So let's say, for example, I want to insert some columns uh, up here. Uh, let's say right after my northing and easting column. I'm just going to go ahead and right click on my, my Y column. And I'm going to say, let's insert a new column. And that will uh, make me a blank column right after uh, the column that I have selected. And I'm going to go ahead and just add a second one in there uh, so that I can have a place for both my latitudes and my longitudes. So you'll see it adds those in there with the default name. Then we can just simply right click on those and say, let's rename that column. And so the first column I'm going to call my latitude. And I'm going to click OK. We'll see that rename. And same thing, I'm going to right click on C13 there. And it chose those names because I had uh, 11 columns in my data already. So it's added them in there uh, with uh, their designation for what number of columns uh, we have. So I'm going to say rename column on that C13 placeholder. And I'm going to call that my longitude. We'll say OK. And then it renames and updates on the spreadsheet. So now I can go ahead and select those new empty uh, placeholder columns. I'm going to select latitude and call that latitude in the dropdown. I'm going to grab longitude in the dropdown. 
So now I have input northing and easting of x and y, and output latitude and longitude uh, with their appropriate names. Uh, in this case, I chose the, the same word for output. Uh, you can have anything you like in there. Some folks like to use abbreviations. Uh, some folks like to include extra information, such as uh, they, you might say latitude, uh, nat83, longitude, nat83, and so on. It's completely free text in there. Uh, the only thing that is a restriction on the column names is because they are used as uh, settings, uh, we have to have distinct names in there. So you can't have two columns with the same name. But that's really the only uh, limitation on naming your columns. Um, then we could go down and set up uh, an output data file. So I'm working with an Excel sheet here. If I wanted to write that out as a file, uh, a uh, online database, either a spatial database or an ODBC database, we make that setting down here on the lower left. I'm just going to write this back out to a file. And I'm going to go ahead and name that file. So out on my desktop, I'm just going to give it a very simple name. And I will call this my output file, and we'll save that off there. And we can then go ahead and actually try out our conversion. So there's a few uh, changes around this uh, as well. Um, some of you uh, may not be familiar with uh, the file field being uh, predefined on our job interface. Uh, we have that file field already set up to go. Uh, regardless of whether or not you're partially loaded uh, in your data sets now, uh, the output file field is always going to display there on the interface. Um, this just facilitates writing your data uh, directly out to file rather than having to do that in subsequent steps. And the interface now is no longer going to change uh, with the buttons of preview and process depending on whether or not you are partially loaded or not. Um, so there is only one mode now. Um, the, the file field is always going to be there. And if we just want to see the conversion on screen, we want to take a preview of that. We're going to hit the preview button. And it's going to ask us about that, that header information that we've written in there. Uh, the files uh, are not yet created, uh, but we will see that uh, conversion sampled for us on screen. We can take a look at that and get an idea of whether or not our conversion is falling into the, the right numeric ranges. Uh, we can take a look at our formatting to see if we've got enough decimal places and things like that. The output file does not yet exist, but we could uh, go down, uh, if we're uh, assuming that our, our data is going to be appropriately converted there, we can just go right back down there and hit process, and it's going to write that file uh, for output to the location that we've selected in there. Now, at this point, the simple conversion uh, is complete. There are a few other things that we can take a look at in here. Things like setting up multiple conversions, setting up batch conversions, uh, if we have a repetitive series of tasks, and still, uh, just like we used to, support for things like loading in ASCII text data. Uh, so there are still a number of capabilities of the, the point database uh, conversions that we've only just scratched the surface on here. But that's the general process for setting up just one simple conversion. Okay, so next we're going to take a look at setting up a batch conversion, uh, where we have several sheets that all need the same operation performed on them. So what I'm going to do is use the, the toolbar here on the, the, upper, uh, the upper toolbar. I'm going to create myself a new point database conversions job with blank settings. So I'm going to go grab a, uh, another spreadsheet here. I have a series of Excel sheets that are all the, the same structure. We're going to open those up. These ones do have headers. And we'll see that we have a series of longitudes, latitudes, and then some attribute data that was recorded at those point locations. Now, each of these five sheets has that same style of data. So longitude, latitude, uh, the test ID column, and then the result column. And what we're going to do is perform a uh, conversion to take those from WGS84 lat long that the input coordinates are in. And we're going to take that out uh, to a UTM projection uh, for output. So the opposite of what we just did in that, that first step. So our input system is actually good. Uh, it is our default system of WGS84. I'm going to double click on my output system and just very quickly grab onto uh, the UTM zone uh, for zone 19 on WGS84. 
So I've got my coordinate system set for input and output. Uh, I can pick my input columns based on latitude and longitude. I already have those found in the grid. And I need to add some for the output. So I'm going to do just like we did a moment ago. I'm going to say insert column. I'm going to rename that column as latitude. All right, whoops, excuse me. We're going out to a projected system, so I'm going to call that one my northing. And I'm going to insert another column, and I'm going to call that one easting. So we now have northing and easting, and we're going to set those as the outputs for our uh, conversion here. Now you'll notice because I have an output coordinate system that is a projected system, we can optionally add columns for scale factor and convergence. And this is where we'll see some fields come and go depending on whether we've selected a horizontal system, a vertical system, uh, or a geodetic or projected system. There are a few fields that will come and go depending on exactly what type of a calculation we're going to be performing here. So we're going to keep this one simple. We're just going to stay horizontal. Uh, we're going to go from longitude and latitude to northing and easting. Uh, I'm, I can double click on my center box here to see if we need a transformation. But again, because both sides are set to WGS84, we're not going to need that for this case. Now I can go ahead and write this uh, uh, file back out. Um, so I can give this a simple name. I'll just call this sheet one and it will prompt for if we want to save that header information into the Excel sheet. I'll just go ahead and say yes. And then we can go ahead and try our preview. See our converted output. Make sure everything looks appropriately. We have the right number of decimals. We're in the expected numeric ranges, things like that. And then we can go ahead and say process. And that will actually create that file for us on output. Once we've done that uh, single sheet, uh, we might want to take a look at the output, make sure that file is actually as we expect it is. But then if we want to spawn this into a batch, this starts with everything we've done so far. Then we just simply go over to the project manager and we right click on that job. So we right click on it and we select batch add and up pops the generate point database conversions interface. This is where we're going to add in all of those other files. So here I can grab those other four files and could be four, could be 400, could be 4,000 files. We're gonna open those up. It's gonna prompt us one more time just to make sure they all have the same settings so they all have a header in them. Um, and I'm gonna say yes to that. You'll notice a large number of the settings are actually grayed out. And this is because we started from that single job using this as a template. There is a way to manually create a, a batch of uh, point database settings. You can just simply right click in the project manager and say create new batch with no settings predefined. That will um, allow you to enter this dialog uh, with all the settings enabled. Uh, it's much, much simpler if you set up a, a job as a template and copy all those settings. All this stuff is already set for you by the time it comes in and you can just go straight to adding your data and then creating the output uh, names on those. So we can add either a prefix or a suffix to the original file names, uh, select the output formats, and then just simply select a place for those to go. Once we've selected our output folder for those, we hit generate, and that's going to return us back out uh, to the uh, the main screen and you'll see now in the project manager there's a new node uh, the batch point database conversion and you'll see each uh, individual file uh, that will be run in that batch is going to have its own job settings and we can actually uh, click into those and see the unique uh, data fields uh, for each of those uh, we can inspect all the individual values we can take a look at the column settings the output data field uh, for example and just make sure all of those settings are exactly as we expect, uh, whether it's the naming options or the settings themselves. Now to actually run that batch, we just simply right click on the batch node in the project manager and select process. As that's ticking away, uh, you'll see the 
process manager down on the bottom of the interface. Uh, you'll see the uh, progress bar fill up as it's working its way through the various jobs. And each job will have a progress bar that in most cases for uh, point databases, you'll see those flip by very, very quickly rather than chugging through with incremental progress. Uh, these are very, very fast operations. Um, once that's complete, you'll see the progress bar for the entire batch uh, go to green and finished. And if there are any warnings, uh, any errors, things like that, you might see an individual file get flagged with a different color uh, saying uh, errors or finished with errors. There's a couple of states that can exist in. Um, and that will indicate that the batch is complete and point you to any places where you might have had some potential problems with that batch. Okay, so next up, let's take a look at one of the newer capabilities that we've added to the point database conversions job with this release. And specifically, I'm talking about multiple conversions. This is a setting uh, that we have over here on the, the left hand side of the interface. The ability to do multiple conversions uh, is something that we've had uh, in several releases now. This is a few years old, but we've subtly changed the way that we go about doing that and it's made it much much more powerful of a tool uh, to have in the context of a point database job. So to, to work with this one I'm actually going to click back to uh, the job that we started off with that individual job that we turned into our batch and I'm going to I'm going to tweak this I'm going to add some settings to it. Now uh, the multiple conversions that you may be familiar with uh, in the calculator were we could right out to multiple columns at once. So we could go out to Northing and Easting and we could go out to something else, another set of columns, but it still had to be the same output uh, conversion. The input system and the output system had to be the same thing for all of the columns that were going to be uh, converted. Uh, with this breaking out of the individual uh, conversion jobs, uh, we were able to redesign that interface and we now have the ability to actually perform completely different conversions, uh, different coordinate systems from input and output to different columns uh, in the spreadsheet. So we already have one set up here. So this is gonna actually represent our first conversion. And I'm gonna use the multiple conversions dropdown here. You'll see that we've just got one in there. I'm gonna hit the little plus button and that's gonna simply add number two. And so we'll have two conversions listed in our operations here. Now the most common thing that folks have been asking for around this function is a single set of input coordinates going out to different coordinate systems for output. So what I'm going to do here is just that. I'm going to start off with our WGS84 coordinates. Uh, so it's going to read the same input columns and I'm going to create another set of coordinate outputs out here. So something we might do here in the states is I might uh, want to insert another column for a, uh, a second uh, latitude and longitude. We might want to see these coordinates both in WGS84 and in, for uh, say for example, NAD27. So I'm going to rename that uh, and I'm going to call that NAD27 lat. And then I'm going to insert an, one more column We'll rename that and we're going to call that NAD27 long. And just so we can really see what's going on here, I'm going to clear out uh, the columns that we did before. So I'm just right clicking on those headers and I'm selecting clear so that we're starting at the beginning again. Uh, in my second conversion here, I'm going to change my output coordinate system. I'm going to go back up to my geodetic list and I'm going to find NAD27 under the North America folder and click OK. Then we're going to need to select a coordinate transformation uh, to relate our input and output systems. So I'm just going to double click on our coordinate transformation box and quickly select the transformation best fit for main here. So back out to our main screen, we have our input and output systems with the coordinate transformation relating those. And then if we click back to conversion one, we'll see different settings being applied there. So completely different coordinate systems, uh, completely different columns uh, involved there. So conversion one and conversion two. Uh, I just need to actually move over to my new columns here for latitude and longitude, missed that step before. All right, so we have our uh, 
conversion one and conversion two. Let's take a look at those again. So conversion one, going from columns latitude and longitude in WGS84 over to columns northing and easting in UTM zone 19. And conversion two, same input coordinates, except that we're going to be out going out to a different coordinate system, two different columns for output. So again, we can preview that and run that through our output and we'll see completely different coordinates uh, in both of those columns appearing. And then again, we can also hit process and write that file uh, all the way for output. Uh, common questions we've been getting about this are, how many of these can we have? Uh, the answer to that is it's totally up to you. You can have any number of outputs. Uh, it's not uncommon for uh, uh, land surveyors to want to see six or seven different uh, coordinate systems representing different units, different formats, whatever you want to see in there. Uh, the coordinate system settings are wholly independent from each other. Um, so it's, it's really up to you how many different conversions you want to have in there. If you do save these settings uh, into your, your job and into your workspace, all of those different uh, conversions, the multiple conversions that you're running, all those different transformations, all of that gets saved right into the job, just like any other settings uh, that you might put in place. Okay, so now let's shift gears a bit and see how some of the different functions that used to be all together on one interface have split apart into these new distinct point database uh, calculation jobs, whether it's a conversion or forward inverse or some of those others. Uh, for the, the, the finishing up section on this session, we're going to take a look at the forward and inverse. So what I'm going to do is click over to a job that I've already got some data loaded into. Uh, this is now a distinct job type, and you'll see the form is actually a little bit different from one of our conversion job forms now. Uh, because forward and inverse are calculations relating to distance across the surface of a single coordinate system, uh, or rather the, across the surface of a single datum, uh, you'll notice that there is no datum transformation box in the center of this job. And that is very much uh, like it used to be when you would click onto a forward or inverse calculation from the old style PDC job. Uh, just like the, the new conversions job, we've gotten rid of the column settings button, and all of those column settings now exist right out on the main form. Um, so again, it's just a slightly streamlined interface. Uh, it's gotten a little more compact. We can see more rows of data actually on the screen. But all the same functionality that used to be there is still there. It's just a little bit easier to get to everything. So for this example, uh, we're doing a, a completely different type of calculation here. This is not a conversion. Uh, this is going to be a distance calculation. So forward uh, takes a known starting coordinate, and I have two columns of starting coordinates here on the, on the left of my table. And these do happen to be WGS84 latitude longitudes, so I'm going to leave those set right as they are. And I can pick a different coordinate system for output. I could put this out onto a projected system if I wanted to. Uh, for this case, to keep it simple, I am just going to keep it right on WGS84. So I have the same style coordinates for input and output. Uh, the one thing I am going to check is that my format is set to match uh, for the input and the output. So I have uh, degrees, minutes, and seconds with two places of precision for my inputs. And I also want that for my outputs. So I'm going to use our unit display settings dialog to make sure I've got degrees, minutes, and seconds on both sides. Uh, we're going to have two places of precision. And I'm going to have a suffix for north, south, east, or west uh, with a space in between it. Uh, we'll see the examples down at the bottom matching up my format. So I'm going to have the same style coordinates for input and output here. So what we need to do now is just like on a conversion, we just need to fill out the appropriate uh, settings uh, for the column settings. And instead of the old style uh, where we bring up another dialog to do this, we're going to do it right on the main form. So I'm going to go ahead and match up my latitude column with my uh, latitude column in my table. Likewise with longitude. And part of the forward here is choosing a method. So we need to choose between uh, primarily geodesic and RUM. Uh, if you have uh, a projected coordinate system uh, defined in the job, you'll also see a grid option available there for a method. 
And for those of you working in a very specific part of uh, air traffic control, uh, the CCG Cartesian color grid uh, might be of interest to you. Uh, and for those of you who are not working in aircraft, air traffic control, uh, that is simply a, a form of a, a shorthand uh, notation uh, that allows uh, air traffic controllers to uh, identify the location of a plane uh, moving very quickly, uh, things like jet speeds. Uh, it's a shorthand to allow them to quickly relay positions of that plane relative to a control tower. So a very, very specific uh, form of, of calculation there. Uh, what's for the rest of us are primarily the geodesic and RUM and grid methods if we're working with a projected system. So geodesic is our default. Uh, that is uh, what we think of as the as the crow flies distance. It's the shortest distance between two points across the uh, ellipsoidal surface. Uh, a RUM line is a line of constant azimuth. So if we're going to hold a fixed uh, heading to get between those two points, a slightly different navigational path. Uh, they go in very, very slightly different uh, directions, uh, but they still get from start to finish. Um, those methods, uh, we simply choose those in the method dropdown. I'm going to leave mine set right on geodesic there. Uh, the distance, then we simply apply that to the distance that's going to be uh, stored in our table. And in this case, my distances are in meters away from those. If I needed to change my units, I could simply click that units button uh, to bring up a, another dialog, allow us to change the units and uh, pick whatever type of unit we need to be working with there. And likewise with the azimuth, I just need to set that to the column where I have my headings and pick the appropriate units for that heading as well. Now just like a conversion, I need some place for my output to go. So over on the output side, uh, I can overwrite existing placeholder columns if I have those. Uh, but if I don't, then I simply need to right click on the table. We'll say insert column and I'll give that column a name. I'm going to call my first one uh, just a, a simple abbreviation here of lat2. And likewise, uh, I'm going to make another placeholder column and I'm going to call that one long2. And again, I'm doing that just solely because the columns need to have unique names in order to be able to differentiate them with their settings. So once I have my placeholder columns uh, out there, I can go ahead and pick those uh, just like any other column. So lat2 and long2. And you'll see this other option there. And this option has always existed on the, the point database uh, forward inverse. Um, and what, what this allows us to do is use a different form of uh, spreadsheet. So right now, what I have are uh, single uh, coordinates with an azimuth and distance away, and we're going to place our output position uh, out in these new columns. Uh, what I have here is a, uh, basically a whole series of individual segments. So each of these are independent of each other. If I had a single starting coordinate as my uh, beginning point of a, a line of waypoints, I could toggle on the option to use the output point as the next input point. And what that does for us, it allows us to start with a single input coordinate, and then it actually writes the output back into that column on the subsequent row. So you can have a single starting point, a series of distances and azimuths away from that point, and then uh, it will plot for us a series of connected segments. So basically a, a series of waypoints along a line rather than this disconnected series of start points and end points on a traverse. Uh, so two, two distinct types of uh, calculation you might, might do there. They are both the same calculation. It is still distance and azimuth away from a start point, um, but just two different uh, applications there depending on the, the use case that you have with your particular data. So in this case, I'm going to leave that off. We have our disconnected line series, and I'm going to go ahead and hit the preview function to allow that to fill in for us the endpoints of those little traverse lines that I have. So again, just a, a slightly different way of going about a point database job. Uh, in this case, we're, we're doing a unique function, uh, predicting output points from a start point and that distance in azimuth. Uh, if we were doing an inverse, uh, we would simply toggle the, the drop down uh, to an inverse function, and that would allow us to perform those distance and azimuth calculations uh, between points that already exist. Uh, so just another way to uh, work with these, these new point database interfaces. 
Um, so what we're going to do uh, next in some of our subsequent sessions is we'll be coming back and talking about some of the, the more uh, niche functions here. We're going to be doing another session um, sometime over the next few months on working with local data, uh, doing best fit uh, coordinate systems, uh, working with datum shift derivations for local areas. Those really do merit their own session, so we're going to come back and handle that in, a, in another segment. Um, the scale and translate as well is another very niche uh, function. Uh, this, this session we've just wanted to introduce the new structure, uh, the way the different jobs work, uh, how those, those jobs are laid out and where we see those, those optimizations and the streamlining. So that's going to wrap it up for today's session. Uh, as always, if you have any questions about this or other sessions, please feel free to write into our tech support group at geohelp at bluemarblegeo.com or visit us on our homepage there at www.bluemarblegeo.com. And thanks, and we'll see you next time.